The Alabama Booksmith presents Author Spotlight. Because every book in our store is signed, our Wall of Fame displays a breathtaking array of writers and signatures. Close-up shots reveal giants of literature, acclaimed historians, stars of stage and screen, our nation's leaders, famous sports heroes, and thousands of other esteemed authors. Today's Wall of Fame guest is Rick Bragg, who will discuss his new book, Where I Come From, Stories from the Deep South. We are on location in the foothills of the Appalachians at Rick Bragg's home. And here is Rick Bragg, his dog Speck, with our host, Jake Reese. Hello, Rick Bragg. Hey, buddy. Hey man, what a treat. Thank you for taking time from, I know, an incredible schedule and inviting us here to this gorgeous place. It's just, I think I could write in this tone. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's let's not be hasty. <laughs> what, a, what a treasure. This is, I know Rick Bragg fans around the world are going to be thrilled to finally see... Uh, where you come from? Well, you're way too nice to me as usual. We, uh, we'd like to take a moment to uh, talk about Rick Bragg just for a moment and try not to embarrass you and let you know how important you are to our joint for the last almost quarter century. Has it been that long? Good God. Well, Rick Bragg has won the Pulitzer Prize and the Harper Lee Lifetime Literary Award and more than 50 important accolades. Just amazing what, uh, <coughs> what a uh, treasure Rick Bragg is to uh, fans of his throughout Alabama. He was in the inaugural class uh, inducted into the Alabama Writers Hall of Fame along with Harper Lee and since her passing is the most beloved writer. He is far and away the biggest selling writer in the history of our store and to help make our point we shot a video of Rick Bragg titles before hitting this way. The best cook in the world. Tales from my mama's table. This is a delicious collection. The Prince of Frogtown. This book has a focus on Rick's dad and stepson. Somebody told me these are Rick's Pulitzer Prize winning newspaper stories. The most they ever had. Rick's testimonial to the mill folks. Jerry Lee Lewis, his own story. Who better to tell the killer's own story than Rick Bragg? Next are a few treasures that were not published by Rick, but has his fingerprints. Alabama's Rick Bragg, Out of the Dirt. This is the video documentary of Rick's life. My Bookstore. Writers celebrate their favorite places to browse, read, and shop. John Grisham, Richard Russo, and dozens of America's finest wordsmiths share their thoughts on special bookstores. Hmm, I wonder which shop Rick mentioned. Go Set a Watchman, a limited edition that includes Rick's tribute to Harper Lee. And the biggest selling title in the history of the booksmith. All over but the shouting. It was named Memoir of the Year, and of course it's about Rick's mother. 
It's also available in this gorgeous red leather slip case limited edition. Whew! And to be signed October 27th. Where I come from. Stories from the Deep South. And now that uh, we have our raving glorification out of the way, let's talk about the new book. Okay. Uh, readers from around the country will have a better understanding of the South. And folks from around here are going to nod and say, uh-huh, every time they turn the page. I hope so. Let's start with uh, uh, picking a handful of stories. Let's talk about the outcasts. <laughs> Tell us about that. I, what a great way to start the book off. Well, the outcast started right down here at the pond. Uh, <clears throat> a few weeks before, we had, uh, me and my brothers and my mom, we had all been to Collinsville, Alabama, to the trade day mm -hmm. to purchase uh, a goat. <laughs> uh, uh, not just any goat, but a, 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 a massive billy goat the size of a small cow. Uh, and why my brother wanted him, he, you know, he said he was going to get some some nanny goats and they were going to uh, get with uh, the billy goat. Get with is a technical breeding term. <laughs> and uh, I they, think I got yeah, <laughs> they were going to they were going to get with uh, the the big billy and and we we're going to have all kind of goats running around. And uh, uh it didn't work out well. First of all, he butted the side of my Ford Bronco so hard it rocked on its wheels, and then he—he um, he was just a terrible goat. My, my brother named him Ramrod, and uh, and uh, we brought him home. Uh, he proceeded to like terrorize everybody and everything, including the donkeys. I mean, if you'll butt a jackass in the head, you'll take on anything. And uh, one day I was down there fishing with my brother Sam. My little brother was doing something else. And on my backswing, I wasn't getting enough distance on my cast, on my backswing, I really torqued it and let it go, or I thought I did, and I had hooked Ramrod right between the horns, and he took off running. I mean, what do you do? I mean, you know, you can't set your drag on your fishing reel for a goat. I mean, there's no measurement on it for a goat. <laughs> So he took off, and that thing was just singing. And I ran beside him because I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to hurt him, you know. And I shouldn't have worried. You couldn't have hurt him with a bazooka. <laughs> and uh, and uh, <clears throat> as I was running, I was actually thinking to myself, well, this is, this is it. I had always known I was the worst fisherman in the world, and here was proof. And uh, my little brother calmly walked up, and that's Mark, he calmly walked up and plucked it out from between his horns and patted him on the head. And I was just left there with my futility. Uh, and it, it just occurred to me that I, I, you know, I, I, I was the most pitiful fisherman in my whole family. What a great story to uh, start the collection. You, uh, you've included pieces about two of the best storytellers who have ever put pen to paper. In fact, they really put pen to paper. All right. uh, just the mention of Harper Lee's name will get everyone's attention. 
uh, love your take on that movie. Share with our audience a little bit about that great story. Well, I'm, I'm like everybody else that ever tried to write a story of any kind. You know, Harper Lee was, uh, you know, was a mysterious figure. You know, not just a, a law deep one, but a, but a, you know, a mysterious figure. And and a lot of uh, friends of mine had had tried to, you know, hunt her down and and really just to kind of touch the hem of her garment. You know, just to have a few minutes, uh, uh, let alone, you know, uh, sit down on the porch. Well, look at here, just in time. <laughs> that was not staged, folks. <laughs> we, we got hickory nuts here that are as big as baseball, and they will take you out. Uh, they will take you out. Also a windshield. Or knock out the dog. Well, duck the hickory nuts as they fall. Well, what happened to the dog? Did the dog leave? Oh, I can see we were paying that dog good money to be a prop. <laughs> There's one more uh, legend we missed that uh, I love this story. Tell us about your relationship with Pat Conway. <laughs> that was different. <laughs> yeah, that was different. Uh, Pat certainly. Uh, Pat didn't wait for anybody to come and knock at his door. <laughs> Uh, one day I just get a call, and, and it's Pat Conroy telling me he's read my book, and he, he's going to, by God, tell me everything that I ever or didn't want to know about it. And he, he just was, you know, he was just kind of a champion, you know. And, and I thought, well, isn't this great, you know? My best friend is now Pat Conroy. <laughs> well, we're going to be best buds. We're going to go fishing in the low country. And, you know, he's going to cook me crab cakes. And that ain't quite the way it worked out. He would never call me when I was home. He would always somehow, he had this radar. And he would call and he would leave these, you know, hour-long messages on the answering machine and then the voicemail. And it, and, it, and, and it would always be the same message. It would be, Bragg, this is Conroy. I guess it's up to me to keep this dying friendship alive. Ours could have been a father-son relationship. But you spurned me for those New York Yankees. And you, you, you ran off and thought you were too good to associate with the likes of me. And, but I, I, my broad shoulders can carry that burden, and, and I just want you to know that I will keep trying, you know, son. And uh, and even that made you kind of walk on air, you know. And, and you know, Conroy had written some of the prettiest lines. Conroy didn't write pretty lines. Conroy wrote elegant. Conroy wrote with with a pure elegance, and if you've ever heard him read out loud, you, and, and as you know, you know what I mean. So, um, and then he would always uh, end by saying, you know, he would say, "I love you, son," and he'd hang up. And that part, you know, was real. And, uh, and meaningful and, and heartfelt because behind your back you have awful nice things to say about Well, I'm glad because <laughs> to my face I sometimes... But he, um, um, you know, but later I would find out that, that, that Conway had that conversation with, you know, a dozen people or two dozen people. He had, 25. Right. You know, he, that was his shtick. His shtick. His shtick. But he... There was still in it this incredible generosity. You know, I never will forget uh, going to a, a wedding with, with Conroy and, and uh, hickory nut time. <laughs> and, uh, just for the camera. Everybody.
<laughs> yeah, the, only the dog is one that has sense enough to move. Hang in here, buddy. There might be. He doesn't really get. He he gets dog treats, but mostly he gets uh, he gets uh, cold cuts. Mm. So he's got it made. Okay. And uh, yeah, he's a good boy. Um. But uh, Conroy, yeah, we're we're standing around and this. And there is a rabbi, and this is not the beginning of a bad bar joke, but there is a rabbi and Conroy are discussing lay preachers in the Deep South who could not read. And 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 Conroy was trying to explain how, you know, a lay preacher didn't have to read back in the hills, back in the mountains. It, you know, they preach from the spirit and they you know, and the rabbi, you know, was trying to explain to Conroy that no, you had to be a student of the text. You had to be a student of, you know, of the faith. And and I just remember standing there watching that, and I thinking to myself, nowhere else on earth beyond the circle of Pat Conroy would I be having this discussion. You know, but he, um, you know, I can. I probably steal the spirit of a Pat Conroy line about once a month, you know. Uh, um, I'm sure the title of, of my book, Prince of Frogtown, I was thinking about, you know, Pat's line, about the, the father in Prince of Town. He was the Prince of Town. Well, it was great having uh, Pat Conroy in, in your new book, and I know Rick Bragg fans are going to love reading about him. I would challenge your readers as they look down the list of stories to know what the heck the story is about entitled The Dancing Skinny. <laughs> Give us a preview of what the heck is The Dancing Skinny. Well, uh, we had... Um, Several years ago, uh, had, we have always gotten strays. Speck is a stray. He, I found him starving up on the ridge line up here. Um, stray dogs have always wandered here, and if they were too sick to move on, then um, you know my mom would care for them, or, or my brothers, or me. And um, Skinny was a. a Part looked like part foxhound, part red bone, and she was spec. Come here and be good. Come here. But Skinny was uh, he's terrorizing the photographer over there. Um, stop that! We took you to the doctor to try to get that taken care of. Come here. Sit down and be good. Sit down. Sit. Or don't sit. Just stand there. Uh, yes, you can see the Rick Bragg obedience school. Is. But um, Skinny was just this ferocious watchdog and yet kind and gentle um, companion. Um, and she was here for years. And she, um, had this intelligence that, that just defied the real world. I mean, she, you know, she would, uh, she figured out immediately that this dog was bad trouble. And, uh, <laughs> and she kind of took care of things, took care of the ducks, took care of, uh, uh, the donkeys. We have a big mule out there that weighs about a thousand pounds. She ran off coyotes and would fight them, you know, uh, three or four at a time. And she was just this bigger than life dog. And, you know, not a, a, not a terror or a rapscallion the way that dog is, but, uh, but, but just a, uh, just a 
a, a, a brilliant dog. And, uh, you know, and, and she wasn't even my dog. She was just the place's dog. And when she passed, I just had the hardest time uh, putting it in some kind of place. Uh, I mean, it was just such a sad time. She died in the middle of those, remember two years ago when we had those months where it rained every day for about four months? And she passed away in that time. We buried her down there in the uh, dormant orchard down there. Come here and be good. We're talking about your cousin Skinny. And, um, um, it, was just, it just hit me a lot harder than the loss of any dog ever had. So, so the, you know, one, yeah, for the first time in my life, I, I really believe, you say it a lot, you say, I'll write this to get it out of my head. You know, writers say that all the time. I never really believed it. But I kind of wrote a, a long story about Skinny to kind of get it out, out of my head. Well, it was a, a great addition to the new book, and there's a rumor while we're talking of canines and while Speck is here, there's a very strong rumor that there might be a whole book coming out soon by Rick Bragg uh, on that subject. May, may we have a hint of what's coming? Yeah, I, uh, I have always wanted to do a whole book on a dog. Uh, and maybe every Southern rider does, uh, except the ones who don't have a soul. and Those are cat people. Uh, so I, I found this dog, this terrible dog, uh, kind of an illegitimate Australian Shepherd, starving up on the ridge line up behind the house about a half mile, maybe less away. And, um, you know, he was too far gone to, I mean, it just broke your heart. He was, you know, just just sticks. So I walked up the hill and got him. I knew well, going up the hill it was going to turn out bad. But as I wrote in the book, men in my family are not careful. You know, we're, we're not careful. You know, my little brother once drove a, a Ford Bronco across a railroad trestle. And, 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 you know, wound up down in the ravine. And when people ask him, why'd you do it? He said, well, you know, I thought I could. And I went and got this dog, I guess, believe in having the same. But we, we never are careful. There are only regrets and bail and fines. And, you know, we, but, you know, there's not a lot. Of, there's not a lot of maybe I shouldn't have done that. Um, and... Uh, so I went up and got him, and it was like toting up. I remember thinking he was so light, you know, it was like toting a, 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 a pillowcase full of feathers Ooh. or sticks. And uh, so I went and got him, and he immediately attacked every dog on the yard, and he tore up everything and just was just a terrible dog. I mean, as soon as he was able to move. And, uh, you know, but, you know, in that weird way that happened, he became, you know, he was my dog. And, you know, he attacked the, the livestock. You know, he's a herding dog. So he would herd them, but he didn't have any idea where he wanted them to go. So he would herd them, and they hadn't been any place special. They were just tired. You know, and then he'd come trotting up like he'd really accomplished something. And, you know, he just, just a... Terrible, terrible dog. And next year we're going to have a book about this terrible dog. Yeah. A whole book? Because if you can write about magic dogs, and if you can write about loyal dogs and faithful dogs, then you ought to be able to write about terrible dogs. So uh, it's it's going to be called the, um, the Speckled Beauty. Because when he got hurt, he got tore up twice by dogs. He would he didn't understand that every pack of strays that went through he was not supposed to run off. Because this was his place now. 
and so he got wounded badly <clears throat> twice and the second time I was rushing in to get my keys to my truck to take him to the vet and my mom was just outside just talking to him and he was literally on the asphalt in a puddle of blood <clears throat> and, uh, and she was just talking to him like he was a human child she was telling him the story of a cousin we had named Geraldine you can't make this up and Geraldine had so many freckles on her face and uh, yes. speck. speck. And uh, so she looked at him and said, so that's what we'll name you. We'll name you the Speckled Beauty. And uh, so I took him to the vet and, the, and of course I didn't have time, you know, holding this tore up dog uh, to give the whole life story of Geraldine Thomason Bundrum. So when she had the, the lady at the desk said, what's his name? I just said, Speck. And, uh, so if a terrible dog, you know, doesn't deserve a book, I don't know what does. But we're, we're looking forward to about this time next year and can't wait to yeah. read the life story of the Speckled, Speckled Beauty. Beauty. Yeah. Uh, most of your fans know most of your awards, but... I don't know if they all know that Rick Bragg has won a James Beard Award. How about that? Yeah, I'm a bon vivant. <laughs> and one of the stories in your book that uh, I read twice and made notes about was New Orleans Po' Boys. <laughs> uh, give us a preview of your New Orleans Po' Boy story. I'll be honest with you, Jake, I've written about 50 stories on New Orleans po' boys because whenever I am sitting around thinking to myself, I need to go to New Orleans, or I'm sitting around thinking to myself, I might want to, you know, make a living, you know, the one thing that you can almost always get somebody to interested in is the story about New Orleans po' boys. So I, uh, it's not a, it, it ain't a hard sell. And magazine editors are funny. You know, they'll forget that I pitched the same damn thing nine months ago. Or I pitched it to their competitor nine weeks ago. But, uh, I mean, the po' boy is kind of like the perfect food for somebody like me. It, it you know, it, it's greasy. Mm-hmm. It's 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 uh, it's 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 on a piece of bread about as long as your leg. <laughs> and it's covered in mayonnaise. So I don't know. I don't know if that's not the. I don't know if that's not the perfect food for somebody like me. And and uh, 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 so you know, New Orleans. Now you can get a po' boy in so many places in the South. But there, to me, the you know I'm kind of a of a purist, you know. The, um, uh, experts on history in New Orleans told me that that it actually comes from uh, uh, dates back before the streetcar strike that gave it its name back, mm. I think, in the twenties. Uh, that it actually goes back to when the the jazz men were coming home from from playing all night long mm. in the in the clubs, like in places like Storyville. And they'd be coming home from uh, playing all night long. They might be a little drunk. <laughs> and, but they would bring home a big, long, foot-long sandwich uh, as a peace offering to their wives. And I forget what that sandwich was called, but, but, but the, uh, it got its, the, the, what we think of the po' boy got, it, got its name. Um, you know, during a streetcar strike, and and I, and I can't think of the name, but there were two brothers who uh, supported the strike, and uh, and it was a terrible strike. I mean, there was you know shooting and beating and you know streetcars burning. It was a terrible time, and uh, New Orleans never has minded solving its problems with a little violence, and. Uh, and uh, these two brothers um, 
were given free sandwiches, but obviously they couldn't be complicated. So sometimes they would just take a handful of fried potatoes and put them in a piece of bread, and, oh. you know, and, and, and pass them out to people. And, you know, any, any kind of inexpensive cut of anything. And, and it got its name because when the, the streetcar workers would come walking up for their free sandwich, the cooks would yell out, here comes another poor boy. And um, so I just love the lore behind food, and, and, uh, uh, and but mostly I just loved eating it. I mean, you know, uh, Domelisi's po' boys in New Orleans can take a handful of fried shrimp, a handful of fried oysters, and make you a half and half. Oh, that's you know they, they don't mix them up. There's literally you know half a shrimp po' boy, half an oyster po' boy. With lettuce, tomato, well, no tomato. Miss Domelisi doesn't believe in tomatoes. Says you can't get said before she passed that you couldn't get a good tomato in the oil, and so she, by God, didn't use them. <laughs> so, you know, just lettuce and mayo and a little bit of red sauce. And I asked one of the, the, the cooks in there what was in the red sauce, and she just said ketchup. There's more to it than that. But, but uh, uh, it, it's, it shouldn't taste that good. You know, it shouldn't. It, but, but some things, especially in New Orleans, taste better than the, the ingredients should allow. But after reading that story, I, I was ready to pack up and go to New Orleans. Uh, it, it, uh, it's the first thing I do when I get there. <laughs> first thing. Cool. You know, a lot of people look at New Orleans as a place to go party. They, you know, they just can't wait to go there and tie on a good nine-day drunk. <clears throat> but, but I, I never have looked at it that way. I, I, I love the architecture of the place, and man, I love the food. Now that's one of the killer stories in this awesome book. And speaking of killer stories. In this awesome book, <clears throat> let's uh, end this preview of stories and tell us about the killer and the time you spent with Jerry Lee Lewis. Well, I, this was kind of the making of Jerry Lee. You know, it was kind of the story behind the story of Jerry Lee. And, and Jerry Lee came about, I got a call from my agent, and she said, uh, you got any interest in doing a, a book about, I think she said, you got any interest in doing a book about that crazy Jerry Lee Lewis? <laughs> and I said, uh, well, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, 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 I would. And, and because, I mean, how could it possibly be a bad book? I mean, how could it possibly be, uh, I mean, it's just so rich, you know, and I never had like that notion of the rock and roll star, you know, all those bows kind of take one track, you know, obscurity, get famous, get drunk, get high, plummet, and then find some kind of redemption. But Jerry Lee was the progenitor. You know, Jerry Lee was the beginning of, and Jerry Lee's bad behavior was off the scale of, of what even the most infamous rock and roll sh singer could conjure. I mean, he would look at the Rolling Stones and just kind of snicker and say, like, you know, amateurs, you know, uh, and but Jerry Lee's losses in life, the, the funerals that he saw go by, the, the violence in it, the, the, all those things were of a extreme, you know, genuine poverty in his youth, um, and just kind of the magic of it, the unbelievable trajectory of the story. I mean, his daddy really did buy him a a used piano because they believed he was touched by God and um, 
And he really did when he fell from grace after marrying his cousin. He really did pack two Cadillacs full of musicians and drum sets and, and instruments and just went on the road, just defying um, his own defeat. And, you know, played in beer joints in Iowa where he beat people up with the butt end of his microphone. You know, um, and um, I don't know. I, mean, I just figured that sitting beside the bedside of someone who was telling you the story of making Elvis cry, or um, or you know, his daddy threatening to cut the throat of Chuck Berry. Uh, that just seemed like that was something that I ought to tell. And so the, the, the story in, in the collection is about going there the first day. And, and he had this rug on the floor. And it was a mountain lion. And, uh, and uh, he had named it Jane after his second wife, who used to... Who used to uh, used to beat him with Santa Claus figurines? You can't make that up either. She would beat him with Santa Claus figurines, and uh, and uh, he would refer to her during the interview and say, oh, "Ain't that right, Jane?" And uh, you know, but he would every now and then he'd sing a few bars of a song. You know, he, 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 uh, he, you know, it, it was just sitting there, and he felt bad the whole time, so I had to interview him in his bedroom, in the bedroom with holes in the walls from gunshots, in the bedroom where he had a small arsenal stashed away in a place where he was ready for whatever ghosts came after and, uh, you know, listening to that day after day, but but also uh, you know doing the, the 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 story that appeared in this collection, um, it gave me a chance to, to use some things that you know sometimes you just can't no matter how hard you try you just can't get them past a obstinate Yankee editor you just can't get you know no matter how hard you try you just can't get it in the book, and I love the lyric. There's an old folk song, uh, can you really, I can't remember it, the genesis of it, but Jerry Lee had changed it to, to, can you really rock and roll, Billy Boy, Billy Boy, can you really rock and roll, Charming Billy, and it's taken from the Charming Billy, and, and, and Jerry Lee had rewritten it to, yeah, I can really rock and roll, I can even do the stroll, but I'm a young cat. And I can't leave my mother. So this story gave me a chance—I mean, to to resurrect some of those things that I couldn't get in the book. And, and uh, um, yeah, I, you know, it, it, there's a good story or two in there. I, I would say uh, there's a good story or two in there. Well, we are uh, so indebted long term to Rick Bragg for almost a quarter century of incredible books uh, and now we add to the deficit today of your kind invitation to bring us to the foothills of the Appalachians and rural Alabama and take time and I know how busy you are particularly with the book coming out. Well you can just tell by looking at me how busy I am today. <laughs> We know, and, and we are so appreciative. Thank you, Rick Bragg. Thank you, Rick Bragg. No, Jake, I appreciate it. You know I do. We are so appreciative of this, and your fans are going to love this, and we thank everybody for watching, and uh, you have an incredible treat in store when you get your copy, your signed first edition of Where I Come From.
You may purchase signed first editions of Where I Come From, as well as signed copies of all the Rick Bragg titles featured at the beginning of this program by going to alabamabooksmith.com.